Well, today uh, we have a message for you that I've entitled Christmas Angels. Christmas Angels. And uh, you say, what is it about? Well, we're going to find out. Now, how many of you have seen that movie, uh, The Ghost of Three Christmases? Right, uh, the Scrooge and, and what's going to happen if he do, does things like that. I, you say, is, is that what we're talking about today? Uh, no, we're not talking about that. But I was just kind of thinking about those ghosts and whatnot. And I thought, you know, the angels are better than that movie. And uh, what we're going to see today in this book of Luke is going to be a great encouragement. Now, I noticed that you guys demoted me in my water. Yeah. <laughs> I guess I must decrease and he must increase. So last time, it started up here with one of those bigger ones and then down, you know. And so I'm rejoicing in the Lord for water right now, though. I remember Tony Shirley one time at the leadership conference, and he talked about having water and however much water you have. You remember that? And he's like, as much water as I had. And he said, you guys must really want me to preach. And he bought all these waters out. So if you all want me to preach a little longer, you just make sure I get a little bit more water. And this is about 20 minutes worth of preaching, okay? And so you know if there's a big gallon, there, we're ready for some preaching. All right, open your Bible to the book of Luke. The book of Luke, chapter number one. Three divine messages that change everything. Luke chapter number one. And uh, let's pick it up in verse number five. The Bible says, there was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abia, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron. And her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in the commandments and ordinance of the Lord, blameless. So uh, you, have, you, have, you have Zacharias and you have his wife Elizabeth, and they're righteous, meaning they're, they're walking with God, they're doing the commandments, they're following through on their ministry, they're blameless, they're above reproach. Now look at verse number 7, it says, And they had no child, because that Elizabeth was barren. And they were both, they both were now well stricken in, in years. What's that mean? They were, they were up in years. And they wanted children. But remember, who, who's the one that opens the womb? It's God that opens the womb. And, uh, and the Bible says that, that they were faithful, they were consistent, they had no children though. And, uh, and they were doing the will of God. And verse number 8, and it came to pass that while... He executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course. According to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense. Now watch what happens as Zacharias is doing his job ministering unto the Lord. And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zechariah saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said unto him, say this next spot with me, these next two words, ready? Go. Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name, what is it? John. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth, for he shall be great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God, and he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and to the, diso and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So Zacharias is ministering, and he's burning incense in the temple, doing his duty, and the angel shows up and tells him, you're going to have a child. It's, it's going to happen. And he says, your prayers have been heard. And at the, at the right moment, the baby's coming. The baby's going to come. But this isn't just any baby. This is none other than John the Baptist. But it says something interesting here. It says he's going to come in the spirit and power of Elias or Elijah. Now, if you remember your Bible, Elijah was a prophet of God and did many mighty works. And God came down, remember the chariot of fire, and swept him up. He didn't even die. And so as you're thinking through the Bible, we're in the book of Luke. I want to try to connect some dots here for you. 
and study your Bible just a little bit. Jesus, God said in the book of Malachi that before the Messiah would come, there would be this man of God that would prepare the way of the Lord. I want to show that to you. Hold your hand right here in Luke. Go left over to the book of Malachi. Or if you're Italian, Malici. Go on over there. And uh, it's just a couple books to the left. And look what it says here. In Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. You say, preacher, what's the blank? I got my blank and my pen ready. You're going to get to that, okay? I promise you. I just got to kind of get a little bit more Bible into you before we give you that, okay? It says this in, in Malachi 3, 1. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. So there's a messenger that's going to come, and he's going to prepare the way before God. And the, Lord, uh, and the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. But who may abide the day of his coming, and who shall stand when he uh, uh, appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire, like... And like fuller soap, and he shall sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. So this messenger is going to come before the Lord, and he's going to be a purifier. Look over to the next chapter, chapter 4 of Malachi. It says in verse number Oh, let's let's pick it up in verse number one. It says, for behold, the day cometh that shall burn as oven and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall stubble. And the and the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. But unto you that fear my name shall the son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall and ye shall tread down the wicked for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this saith the Lord of hosts remember ye the law of Moses my servant which I commanded unto you in, in Horeb for all Israel with his statutes and judgments verse 5 behold I will send you who does it say Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord and now look what Look what the coming of Elijah the prophet would do. And look what his ministry would do. Verse number six. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to who? This preacher, this prophet, this Elijah. He's going to preach repentance, change of heart, change of mind. And it's going to help the dads turn towards their sons and their daughters and have a heart for them. A kind, sensitive heart. Turn the heart. Of the fathers to the children. Now look what it says this. And the heart of the children to their fathers. So it's the, the, the preacher. The man of God Elijah. Is not only going to turn the dad's heart to the children. To love the kids. But it's going to take the kids hearts. And turn them to the dad. Mutual love. Mutual respect. The idea here is relational oneness. And that's what the, the prophet of God would do. Before the coming of the Lord. And the Bible goes on to say. Lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Hey what happens when dad don't love their kids. And kids don't love their dads. What happens when there's no respect. It opens a door of a curse. And so I won't dive deep into that. But kids in here. You need to love and value your parents. You need to take great care of them. And be thankful for them. And appreciate them. How many of you parents know what I'm talking about. You drive them around, you love them, you nourish them, you take care of them. And we live in a culture in a day that kids don't respect their parents. But we need, to re we need to teach our children to respect the parents. Now on the flip side, dad's in here, mom's in here. It's your job to love and nurture your kids. And teach your kids and the, to, to lead them in the way of righteousness. And, and to guide them and to chasten them if they need it. Isn't that right? The rod and reproof gives wisdom. And show them the way that they're supposed to go. And so my point in bringing this to you is now we're talking about Christmas and there was 400 years of silence. This was the last prophecy before Jesus Christ would come. 400 years, there was nothing. And then all of a sudden, Zacharias is in the temple burning incense, doing his duty, doing his job. And an angel shows up. And says, you're going to have a son, but this is not going to be like just any son. Go back over in your Bible, look at verse number, uh, Luke chapter number one. 
He says, this is going to be a special child. I know you guys haven't had any children yet, Zacharias and Elizabeth. But he says in 13, fear not. He says, for thy prayer is heard. Thy prayer is heard. And he goes on to say that this child that you're going to have, verse 15, he shall be great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. And he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall, shall he turn to the, to, to the Lord their God. His job, he would be so full of the Spirit. He would, he would, he would preach messages like, repent, repent, turn yourself, change your ways. He's coming. The Lamb of God is coming. And he would shift the attention of the people from their normal affairs and focus it towards God and living in righteousness. And it says in verse 17, and he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers of the children and, to, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Now, what did John the Baptist preach? Yeah, he preached repentance. And make straight the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. You remember that? So we see a fulfillment. Now I want you to think through this. This angel is delivering a message to a man that needed. And if you're taking notes, if you're taking notes. He was delivering him the message of hope. The message of hope. You say, why, why is it a message of hope? Well, because there's 400 years of silence. Nobody knew what was going to take place. They had these prophecies. But, but as you're thinking about this, all the way from the book of Genesis chapter 315, the Messiah was promised. And then you think about Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. You start thinking about Isaiah. And you start thinking about these prophets that the Lamb of God would come. And, and you start thinking about he would be born of a virgin. It would be Emmanuel. Then you start thinking 400 years of silence. And then you enter in and you're doing ministry with Zacharias. And he's there doing his job, ministering over and over and over again. And sometimes when you're ministering over and over and over again, you can lose heart. You can lose hope. You can feel like, okay. Okay, I'm just doing my duty, right? And all of a sudden, an angel shows up with the message of hope that, hey, you're going to have a child. I know that you wanted a child. I know that you guys have been ministering a long time. Fear not. Don't be afraid. I've got word for you. I've got a promise for you. You're actually the fulfillment of something fantastic that's about to take place that I've set up before the foundation of the world and I've orchestrated and organized this. Understand this, that even when God took up Elijah when the whirlwind and, and the chariots of fire, he knew that the same spirit that was upon Elijah would infiltrate and be born inside John the Baptist, if you would, and the same power to preach and to turn hearts would come to Zacharias. He knew that Zacharias and Elizabeth would not have a baby and they'd be praying, God, give us a baby. God, give us a baby. Please give us a baby. Can you imagine her prayers? Please, please. Come on. My husband's faithful. And I'm faithful. Please give us a baby. And yet nothing, nothing, nothing. You know, there's some scriptures that say hope deferred maketh the heart sick. Meaning if you want something real bad, but then you don't get it, ah, you start losing hope. You start feeling uh, anguish and depression and, and, and defeated. But then it says, when the desire cometh, it's a spring of life. It's, a, it's like a tree of life. And, and all of a sudden, Zacharias hears this message of hope, and he doesn't quite know how to take this thing. He's kind of like, hmm. In fact, he doubts. He doubts. And God says, ah, because you don't really uh, believe me, I'm going to go ahead and let you walk out of this thing without the ability to talk and then when i bring it to pass i'll open your mouth again and sometimes god has these blessings of hope for us and we don't quite understand how to take it yet we have this gift that's going to happen but we don't quite realize and believe that it's going to take place but nonetheless, it is hope. Now, I asked my son, Nolan, to look up the definition of hope on the way here. And it was this expectation of good. An expectation of good. It's, it's more than just a wish. It's, it's rooted in the power of God's promises. And God says, you're going to have a child. And he's like, oh, man, okay. And how many of you guys have ever been there before? You wanted a blessing and you, you had hope over something and then you kind of gave up. <laughs> I mean, you kept doing your job, but inside you kind of let that dream die. And then God, with his angel here, just says, no, it's going to take place. 
And that hope is rekindled and re, reinvigorated. You know, you think about hope. When there's hope in the future, there's power in the present. When you believe something good's going to happen up ahead, what does that do to your heart? Like if you're going to get menchies later, right? Or Christmas is coming. Or the grandkids are coming over. Or, hey, we've got this thing going on. Oh, there's a present for me somewhere? What's it do to the heart? It opens the heart. It brings power into the present because of an expectation of good. That's why we need hope. That's why we've got to stay in God's promises and in his truth because it, it invigorates us. People that lose focus on the promises of God, they start sinking. But those who study the word of God and realize that all the promises of, to you are good and yay and God has good thoughts to you. And when you get those thoughts and those promises built up inside of you, you get built up and strengthened and, and encouraged. Then everywhere you go, you are a walking, talking miracle, a testimony waiting to be delivered. How many of you are testimony waiting to be, to, to, waiting to be delivered? Come on now. That's hope. And that's what we need. We need that hope from God's word. Now, here's uh, three, uh, notice three observations from uh, Zacharias that, that, that I kind of took notice of. This isn't in your notes, but um, um, if you're saying, what's the response? Well, the response that he had um, was that uh, he was speechless. <laughs> I'll let you look that one up. You know, God answered, answered prayer before it ever happens. He told him what was going to happen. You ever had that happen where God's like, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you something that's going to happen in the future. And you're like, oh, even before it ever happens. That's what hope does. Now realize this. You don't need hope when you already have it by sight. That's what faith, faith and hope are like sisters. They, they connect with each other. So that's why you need both. But if you already have something, you don't really need to hope for it anymore. So... God will tell you some things that are going to happen in the future. So he builds up the hope and faith inside of you. So it helps you to be patient. If you lose hope, you lose patience. If you lose faith, you lose power. Here's three observations that I see about Zacharias. Number one, he was faithful to his ministry and his marriage. He didn't get his, he didn't have a baby. He didn't have what he wanted, right? He didn't, or she didn't either. But, but notice he was still faithful, right? Like he was steadfast, he was unmovable. You know how many people quit when they don't get what they want? They throw a temper tantrum? Zacharias didn't do that. He stayed faithful. I mean, he's in there doing his duty. Like he just showed up, right? And that's half the battle. Isn't that how many parents out there know what I'm talking about? Grandparents, just show up, just be there. You know, one of the greatest gifts you can give to your, your church, your pastor, your family is just be there, show up. He stayed faithful to his ministry and his marriage. Number two, he was found in his place of service. He was found in his place of service. A lot of times we think, well, I want God to do whatever I want, and then we're not where we're supposed to be. You've got to be where you're supposed to be. You can't, you can't expect God to bless you if you're somewhere else. Zacharias, what was he doing? Same thing he's always done. At that month, Abio is like, okay, it's time to burn incense. Bye, sweetheart. I'll see you later. I'm going down to the work. You know? And he just showed up. Let me, tell, let me tell everybody out here, just keep showing up. Whether you feel like it or not, whether you get your, aunt, your prayers answered or not, just show up. Be found in your place. And might, might I tell you this, God knows where you live. God knows where you work. God knows what you're doing. He, it's not like his eyes are closed to it. He knows. Just keep showing up. Keep being faithful. Be found in your place. And number three, he was following God's will. He was following God's will for his life. And the angel of God shows up and just gives him that encouragement. And you say, well, preacher, I need my encouragement. I need my hope. Be faithful to your, to your family. Be faithful to your ministry. Be faithful to, to what you know is right in God's eyes and just keep following God. And at the right moment, God will be like, hey, I heard your prayers. I've been listening all along. And guess what? I've got a messenger for you. He's going to bless your blesser big time. And guess what? This is not just like any blessing. This is a blessing I had ready before the foundation of the world, man. I had this thing so planned and perfectly, sovereignly organized and orchestrated. You didn't even know I was going to make you that wait, make you wait that long until I blessed your big time on this thing. But I've already had this thing organized for you. Can I tell you, God already knows what he's going to do. He's got foreknowledge, meaning he saw, he sees the end from the beginning. You and I, we don't. We look around like, oh, what's going to happen? God, God's like, I got this thing. I know what I'm doing. I've got this. I've got this blessing plan for you. Listen, take hope, friends. Hope thou in God. He knows what he's doing. That's the first angel I see. The second angel I see is this. 
This angel we see is, is, is communicating to Mary in Luke chapter number 1, verse number 26. Luke 1, 26. This is a message of favor. A message of favor. And the Bible says this in Luke 1, 26. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth. To a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph. Now that word espoused means that they're, they're going to be married. They have a covenant together, but it's not consummated yet, if you would. And it says there, they, uh, the Bible says this, that, that uh, she's a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. Of the house of David. You say, why is that important? Because God promised to, put, to bring forth the ruler from from the throne of David. He said he would, he would give him the sure mercies of David. The covenant goes all the way from the beginning. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. All the way to David. And he promised David, I am not gonna, I'm going to give you sure mercies forever. I'm going to raise up, if you would, the branch, the Messiah through that lineage. And Joseph's in that lineage. Even though he's not the biological father. You'll see that right there. And it says, the virgin's name. What was her name? The virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou that art highly. What's that next word? She's not just favored. <laughs> she's highly favored. Now, that word favored uh, speaks about uh, uh, support, speaks about defense, speaks about uh, a likeness and a desire, a provision. A, uh, it's, 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 it's a desire that says, I'm going to bless you and take care of you. And I've taken notice of you and, and I cherish you and I value you. And, and I've got something great for you because not only do I love you, but I like you. <laughs> and, uh, and it goes on to say that, that, that she's, the angel says, you're highly favored. And the Lord is, what does that say? He's with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying. Can you imagine seeing an angel? Can you imagine all of a sudden you're just there, either Zacharias doing your, you know, burning the incense, or all of a sudden you're there and you're Mary and you're doing your thing, and all of a sudden, bam, an angel shows up. You're like, how long have you been there watching me, you know? And uh, this, this angel starts speaking to you and, and, and says, Hail, thou art highly favored. And, and when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be like. What's this about? It's almost like a holy calm that's like, what's about to happen here? And the angel said unto her, notice how these angels keep saying the same thing. What's those next two words in verse 30? Fear not. Why is that? Because we as humans are, have a propensity to fear and tremble and get scared real, real quick. But these angels, and even God many times shows up and says, fear not. Fear not. God has this tenderness. Even his ministers, if you look at God's ministers, there's a tenderness to his ministers that, 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 that says, it's okay, don't, don't be afraid. He says, fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name. What's his name? Jesus is the sweetest name I know. And it says this, he shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father, David fulfillment of prophecy there and he shall reign over the house of jacob forever and of his kingdom there shall be no end then said mary unto the angel well how shall this be seeing i know not a man she had she had not had any relations with joseph or any other man and she says how am i going to have a baby how is this going to take place and and the angel answered and said unto her the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also the holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. So Jesus Christ is, like Brother Amos was saying, he is the Son of God. He is God's Son. He is God in the flesh, but he's also born human, which makes him fully God and fully man at the same time. And that's a fulfillment of so many prophecies. And it says this in the scriptures. It says in verse 36, And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month with her, who is called barren. Now read verse 37 with me. Can you look at your page and read verse 37 with me? Are you ready? 
Are you ready? Here we go. Verse 37. Go. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. Let's say that again. For with God, nothing shall be. One more time. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. Oh, we got to keep doing this. I can see you need it. Okay. Uh, some of us, you, you haven't been working your memory verses, and this is a good one. Let's do Luke. What is it? Luke 137. Say it with me. Luke 137. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. Again, Luke 137. For for with God, nothing shall be impossible. One more time. Luke 1, 37. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. What's impossible with God? What's impossible with God? I can't hear you. What's impossible with God? Oh, yeah. Now I'm starting to believe you a little bit. Now I'm starting to feel it. Okay. Make me feel it this time. What's impossible with God? Yeah, that's right. Nothing. Nothing. And so, and so we see this inside the scriptures. That the angel is saying, nothing is impossible with God. Uh, for God, nothing is impossible. And Mary said, now look at her, her response. Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. You know what she does? She quickly goes and finds Elizabeth. And you know the story. When she gets over to her cousin Elizabeth's house, the baby John the Baptist is in the womb. And when as soon as John the Baptist and uh, Elizabeth hear the salutation of Mary, what happens to John the Baptist in the womb? Anybody want to do it for me? Anybody want to act it out? Are you ready? No, do it. <laughs> he, starts, he starts doing flips in the womb. And I got to tell you something. What a blessing that is to be able to see and experience that take place. You say, preacher, what's the message to Mary? The message is this. It's, a, it's the message of favor. And you say, preacher, what's her response? The response is she starts praising God. She just starts praising God. Hey, how do you feel when you know God's looking at you in a, in a likable way? When he's like, hey, I got your back. Hey, I'm going to bless you. Hey, you are favored. I'm going to bless you big time. I like you. I love you. I've got something special planned for you. I'm going to put something in you that is, that is powerful and indestructible and great and wonderful. I've got these things for you. Now look, look at Mary's response in verse 46. And Mary said, my soul doth magnify the Lord. My spirit hath rejoiced in God, my Savior. And my spirit hath rejoiced in God, my Savior. For he hath, he hath regarded the lowest state of his handmaid. You know what she's doing? She's, she's magnifying God. Hey, listen, when you know that God's looking at you with favor, you start getting happy. <laughs> I'll tell you what, the reason I'm, I'm a happy person, I really am. Because I know God's favors upon me. I feel it. I sense him. I, I know it. Everywhere I go, I, I sense his presence and I know his love is upon me. I know he, he knows all the numbers of the hair on my head. I know he knows my future. I know that because of Jesus Christ, he's imputed his righteousness, righteousness to me. I'm telling you what, I sing because I ha I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. But you think about Mary here. She's just, she just, just a regular lady. But in God's eyes, she was not just a regular lady. She was highly favored. God had his eye upon her and said, this is going to be the one that's going to carry my son. She is highly favored and she knows about that this is going to be a, a, an opportunity for her to steward the Messiah. You know, this is an unexpected blessing that she just rejoices over. H how many of you have, have felt the favor of God on your life? You all feel it? Hey, l listen, if you're in this room and you don't feel the favor of God, you're, you're living below where God wants you to live. God wants to give you his favor. In fact, he's already given you Christ. A lot of times it's we just don't know how to, how to receive it. But he loves you so much and wants to bless you. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The greatest day of my life, listen, wasn't the day that I got married, though that was a great day. It wasn't the day that my son was born, though that was a great day. Or my daughter was born, though that was a great day. Or the day that we planted the Victory Baptist Church, that was a great day. The greatest day of my life, by far, was the day that I got saved. When I was 15 years old, and I received the gift of Jesus Christ. Man, I'm, I've been blessed ever since then. And I've got favor on my life. Now, I'll tell you, I've messed up a whole lot. But I'm saved and I have his favor because of his love and his unconditional grace to me. I just put my faith in him and he just keeps pouring it on me. And I feel so loved and so blessed every single day I wake up. Can you imagine, Mary, getting this news that you're going to carry the Son of God? You're highly favored. 
she just busts forth and just starts praising God. You know, I don't even know if that was the, the cultural thing to do for her, but man, she didn't give a rip, man. She just starts, yeah, you know, he's my savior. My God's looked upon me, you know, and, he, and she just has a time. You know, here's three facts I, th- I, I think about God's favor. Number one, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and favor. When you, when you respect and honor God, God says, oh, I see that you're, you're, you're respecting me. I see that you're taking notice of me, that, you're, that, 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 that you realize that all of your blessings come from me. Number two, the favor of God is upon those who love God and keep his commandments. If you love God and follow through on his commands, he's, he's certainly going to take special attention to you. You know, it's one thing. You think about this. You, you, we're supposed to love everybody, right? Hello? Are we supposed to love everybody? We love everybody, right? But we don't necessarily like everybody. There's some people that we enjoy spending time with, and there's other people, oh, I have to spend time with this person. (laughs) You know what I'm talking about, where you step back and you go to your place, your closet, and you go, Lord, gird me up with strength and energy, for I go into battle now. I know not how to deal with this wicked tyrant. No. (laughs) fill me because the devil's great upon this person you know and uh you know what i'm talking about right they just they just like they're they're vampires energy suckers and 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 just suck you dry right and and they're like the sith lord you know and you're like oh god help me right and you got to pray before you go on in there you got to pray just to make it that day right in that appointment and so you think about this there's some people you enjoy hanging out with and they build you up and you want to give them favor, you want to give them more time, talent, treasure, because you know they're helping you, and you enjoy being with them. And there's other people, you're like, oh, this is straight up ministry. Good Lord, help me. Right? I want to tell you, don't make God's heart feel that way about you. You listening? Don't make God's heart feel that way. Make it be like, hey, how you doing, my boy? How you doing, my daughter? Make his heart be like, Hey, I, I've been watching you keep my commandments and loving on me and tell people about me and keeping a good spirit, being generous. Man, I love that. Come on over here. In fact, I want to bless you because you're doing such a good job. Let that be God's heart towards you. I believe this. I believe Mary, she had favor with God because she loved God and she was walking with God. I believe that. I think God, God took notice of her because of her heart towards him. Don't get me wrong. I believe that, that he was communicating to her, but she was responding in kind. Are you following? I'm not saying she worked for her salvation, but I am saying that she responded by having her faith in God's grace. And as a result of that, she, she, she developed a walk with God, and God could trust her to yield to him. Another fact about God's favor, number three, the follower of God is majorly blessed. And this is probably the biggest point with his presence, E-N-C-E, and his presence. When, when you follow God, listen, I was thinking about this the other day. You know, you know what the biggest consequence for those who walk away from God is? The loss of time, the loss of closeness, the loss of love and affection that you get from God. Listen, when you don't go to church, when you don't read your Bible, when you're not uh, uh, with God, if you go prodigal, you take all of your resources and all of your stuff and you just kind of go live with the world and you do whatever the world wants. You know what your consequence is? You lost the presence of God, the closeness with God, the affection of God, the, all that time that you could have been with God, enjoying him in his house. You lost that. That's of greater consequence than anything else. It really is. Because then you also get the stripes and the guilt and the shame of, of being away from God. But you know what? That One of the best blessings for those who follow God and walk with God, you get to be with him. You get to lay your head on his chest. You get to have his everlasting arms of comfort around you saying, I love you. I'm with you. More than the gifts that he gives you as far as presents, like Christmas presents, is the gift of his presence. And when you follow God and you're close to God, you get his presence, his closeness, but Wherever God's heart goes, his treasures go with it. And you think about this. Who do you want to bless more? The one that's closer to your heart or the one that's making you upset all the time? Come on, talk to me. You you want to give better gifts to those you know that are receiving and giving good affection and love. And so the byproduct of being close to God is he just wants to be more generous to you. And because and, he can trust you with those blessings. Mary, man, you want to talk about the greatest gift, Jesus Christ. 
getting to steward him. Her response, she busts out with praise, big time praise. Let me give you number three. Number three, this is Joseph. Now imagine this. <laughs> imagine being Joseph. You find out your wife is pregnant with a boy that's not yours. You haven't had any relations with her yet. And you're like, okay, great. My whole future, my whole life's going to be ready. Going to be with my wife, Mary. And, and all of a sudden, he finds out she's pregnant with another person's baby. Now, how would you react? Come on. You'd be like, what in the world? So Joseph, the Bible says being a just man, he's thinking, okay, I don't want to diss her. That's what I love about Joseph. Like, God knows what he's doing. Like, Joseph didn't have this vindictive, evil personality like some of us at times. We're like, oh, you did me dirty. I'm going to do you dirty right back. No. No, his heart wasn't that way. L look, at, look in your Bible at Matthew chapter number one. See, God knows who to, who to, who to steward these gifts. And he, he chose Mary and Joseph on purpose. Not just the, the prophecy and the lineage, but the, he prepared their hearts. In, in uh, Matthew chapter number one, the Bible says in verse 18, now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, meaning this, he, he, he had this, this, this righteousness to him. But it's not like a mean righteousness. It's he wants to do right. He wants to live right. He wants to be right in God's eyes. It's not just, in a, it's not just what everybody else thinks, but it's, it's, he wants to do right for himself, but also others. It's, it's a both and. and. And he's just, he's a just man. And, and the Bible says, and not willing to make her a public example. You know, Joseph wasn't be like, you know what, woman? I'm going to put you on blast on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. It's, this is my baby mama. She jacked up and tore up. And you know what? She did all this stuff and did me dirty. And, and she did this. He didn't, his first instinct wasn't to make her a mockery. You notice that? Charity thinketh no evil. Charity believeth all things, hopeth all things, gives the benefit of the doubt. And even, ooh, this is so good. Even when you don't quite understand how something's shaken out, it's this heart that says, even if I don't get it, even if this is wrong, I'm not going to do you wrong because you potentially did me wrong. I'm not going to make this thing public. I want, I want to keep this thing private. It's this ability to say, hey, I, care, I love you enough and I care about you and I don't want to make this harder on any of us. You know, when you put other people on blast and you get vindictive and evil towards them, you hurt yourself as well as them. But when you have this heart of charity like Joe did, I like calling him Joe. Can we call him Brother Joe? He'll be all right, right? <laughs> call him Brother Joe, right? He's like, oh, man, you can just feel his heart here for a second. He doesn't quite get it, doesn't understand. But he's, he, doesn't, he doesn't want to make her a public example. He was minded to put her away. What does it say? Privately. He wants it, like, privately and just kind of discreetly, like, let's just, and quickly, let's just, okay. You ever been there before? You're like, I don't get this, and I just, I just want to be done with this, and then my heart hurts, and, and this is not how I thought it was going to go. You ever think about that with your life? You're like, man, I didn't think life was going to be this way, and this relationship was going to go this way. I don't want to hurt you, but I just want to be done with this thing. You ever been there before? I just want to be done with this. This is not what I intended. This is not right. But watch the message from the angel. Watch this message. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David. What's these next two words? Say it with me. Ready? Go. Fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife. For that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall be, bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. And he shall, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son. And they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from the sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him and took unto him his wife and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son. And he called his name, what? Jesus. Here's the message. This is the message of embrace, of embrace. You know, there's times in our life when we don't understand what's happening and we're tempted to push away our best blessings because we don't quite see it the way that it's actually happening in reality. Are you following? And Joseph, he was about to take and push away his greatest blessing, his wife. But it wasn't just his wife. It was what was inside of his wife. 
And the angel is like, don't push her away. You need to embrace her. I know you don't get it. I know you don't understand it. But this is the gift of God. And there's times in our life when God sets some things up that are supernatural blessings that are delivered to us in uncommon ways. Are you following me? It's just uncommon. And in those moments, don't ruin your blessings because you don't understand. Go slow. Think through it. Don't react. His response, here's his response. It's a response of acceptance. It's this, this response of, okay, I was going to put her away. I was just going to be done with it. I didn't want to hurt her, but guess what? Because you, God, are telling me to embrace this situation and accept it, I will do as you have said because now I understand I'm doing it for you. This is not how I set this thing up. This is not how I had it in my mind, but this is how you have planned it before the foundation of the world. And because you're asking me and and opening my understanding from a heavenly perspective, I'm going to embrace her. I'm going to accept her. Listen, in your relationships, there's things that you don't quite get, don't understand. And God will say, listen, just, just embrace it. Accept it. The more you kick against it and fight against it, you're actually kicking and fighting against me. Humble yourself down. Here's, here's three truths to help you receive your best gifts in life. Number one, the problems that we see are really opportunities to convert our perceived liabilities into our greatest assets. The stuff that you start seeing as problems, God might be saying, hey, that's actually your best potential blessing right there. But you've got to be willing to accept it. Number two, the power of love overcomes the fear of man and enables the bravest people to be stewards of of Jesus Christ. You know, he could have been like, what are people going to think? Hey, look at me. Don't, don't, don't let what other people think about your life. Ooh, this is so good. I need this. Go ahead and talk to me, God. You know, the preacher gets help too, right, when he's preaching. Sometimes I get so worried about what other people think that I'm tempted to make decisions just so I can correct what other people are thinking that they may not be thinking. Are you following me? And now I'm being led by somebody else's opinion that may or may not be happening. And I'm not thinking about what God wants to do in my life. I'll react because of what people may be thinking that they're not thinking. Or maybe they are thinking. And I've just decided I can't live that way. I need to just live in the love of God. And just do what God wants me to do. And let God worry about what everybody else is thinking. And here's what this allows you to do. Just like, <clears throat> like Joseph, it allowed him to accept and embrace Mary and Jesus as a brave man. Not worrying about what everybody else thinks that says, this is from God and I will bravely accept this thing. And, and whatever mockery and ridicule happens, I will accept it because it's a gift from God. And I'm not worried anymore about what other people think because I know the power of God's love is the greatest motivation that I could ever have. <clears throat> Number three. The best blessings are wrapped in humility and nurtured to bring glory to God. You think about this. This this is really humbling for Joseph. But yet God is saying, I want you just to be humble, accept and embrace Mary and the gift of Jesus. And I'm going to have you call his name Jesus. Remember, the daddy gets to call the name out, right? And so I want you to name him. I want you to steward him. Can you imagine raising somebody that's not your own? But doing it for the glory of God. You know, some of the best dads, they're not even the biological dads. They're the ones that say, I love you and I'll bring you into myself and raise you as if you're my own. Because just because you can create a child doesn't mean that you have that that heart to raise a child the way that a parent should raise a child. But those who say, you know what, this is a gift from God, and I will steward you as if you're mine, that's incredible love. You know who's done that for us? Every single one of us were orphans in here. Every single one of us 
We were bastards and castaways that Satan just ripped us up and messed us up. But our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be his name. He said, I love you. I'll take you. I'll pay your ransom and I'll, I'll treat you like you're my own. And when you're hurting and you're down, you're defeated, I'll nurture you and love you and take good care of you. And because of his gentleness and because of his kindness, he makes us great because of who he is. Believers in here, friends in here, guests in here, don't push away God's greatest blessings when you don't understand it. These three angels are very powerful. They all say, fear not. One was a message of hope, giving that hope to Zacharias. One was a message to Mary, saying to Mary that, hey, you're going to have child and this is going to be a great blessing to you. We need that favor. One was a message of favor. The last one, we see this message of embrace. Hey, believers in here, embrace God. Embrace the people in your life. Your life is short. It's a vapor. The kids that you have, the wife, the kids, the grandparents, those that are in your life, dad, mom, you just never know how long they're in your life for. Bring them into you. Love them. Steward them for God's glory. And if you're in here and you've never been saved before, I encourage you. God loves you. Ask God for forgiveness of all of your sins. Believe that Jesus Christ died for you and he rose again. And you will be able to have Christmas every day in your heart. Amen? Amen.